Okay, well, um, okay, Dave, uh, Chimi Gwech, uh, Gali Hinde, Nyawe, Nagiwa. Um, I guess right now we're going to proceed to begin with the uh, opening of this uh, ceremonial Indigenous People Solidarity Day, uh, which takes place usually on the summer solstice, but uh, June 21st is is the day that it's held every year. And it's been held by every year on June 21st since uh, 1996, when it was decreed, I guess, by the Governor General uh, LeBlanc. So um, um, we began doing uh, the Indigenous People Solidarity Day prior to that in, here in London. We didn't uh, go by uh, uh, the national the federal government. Uh, we proceeded to do our, our uh, Solidarity Day events down in Harris Park, right there at the Forks of the Thames, because uh, the Forks of the Thames is like a, is like a sacred site uh, for our people. There's a story that talks about when uh, John Graves Simcoe was being guided here, brought here by his guides, his indigenous guides. Uh, they came from Fort Detroit and they were on their way to Fort York. So from Detroit to Toronto. So they, and they brought him here and they stayed here because this was a place that was inhabited, settled by Adewandran people. And when they got to the, the forks of the Thames, they saw the trees, you know, uh, much not, I guess mainly the, the uh, down by the water there, there's uh, coniferous trees, like white pine trees, but they saw these trees that had uh, faces carved in them. And the faces that were carved into the, the trunks of the tree, living trees, were uh, of indigenous people uh, and men who were wearing uh, antler, like headdresses. So uh, some of the, there was a couple of people that were amongst them, like the uh, missionaries who, who recorded that. So they have uh, those recordings, they still have those uh, pictures that were recorded way back then, it's, uh, what is it, 1793, and um, they uh, have them at Museum London. So the, uh, I think the history of this territory uh, was known, uh, known from a couple, uh, by a couple of uh, names, uh, Deshkansi Bay, which means Antler River or Horn River, that was one of the names that was given to it. And that's a name that was given in the language of the, of the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe people. And they were, they were people who lived here as well. So I think the Attawandran people were here. Uh, they were known as neutral. So they were neutral because they didn't get involved themselves in what was then um, uh, the British and the French trying to uh, uh, monopolize the the territory and trying to claim it, and so they 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 realized that it was settled already by indigenous peoples. So they knew that they had to go through a protocol of talking to indigenous peoples if they were going to try to lay claim to any of this land, this territory. So uh, this land became known as uh, Deshkansi Bay. And under the Adewandra name, I don't, there, there is a name for it, but I don't, I don't recall what the name for it is. And then the uh, Oneida, the Oneida people, also known as the Onyantaaga. Onyantaaga in Oneida means people of the Standing Stone. The people of the Standing Stone also came here and they were settled here. So they had a name for the, uh, the Deshkansi Bay as well. And they, they re refer to the river as in their language. And that's, uh, that's another name that I'm not, I'm not familiar with. I used to know it, but I don't know it anymore. So uh, if the river actually went by, depending on what, what nation or what language you were speaking, uh, went by that language. So it was, um, the, the, the indigenous people knew what, what water they were talking about, what land this was, but the, uh, the British didn't know, or the French. Now the French people were the first to arrive here, then the British, and then the uh, 
uh, Western civilization came once Upper Canada was declared. So uh, uh, we have never we, we, we had an alliance. The the Haudenosaunee people, people of the Longhouse, that's what the Haudenosaunee means in our language. People of the Longhouse, we had a relationship with the British. Uh, the, the Anishinaabe, uh, the Algonquian language family, had a relationship with the French. And they, uh, we had already established a relationship between ourselves, between the Haudenosaunee, the Algonquian language family, other nations that were in this area, such as Tatawandran, such as Shawnee, such as uh, uh, the Cherokee, the Cherokee were living here. Uh, they all lived here, and uh, we had a treaty that existed here that was called the Dish with One Spoon. So the Dish with One Spoon was the original treaty on how we were going to live here uh, and coexist here. And the Dish, in this case, was the beaver population. There was a lot of beaver here. In fact, there was so much so much beaver here that there was enough beaver here to sustain uh, all the people that lived here and, and as well as visitors who came here. So the, the, the beaver population uh, was our dish. And we all ate from the same spoon, which means that we are all responsible for each other, making sure that they got their fair share. So everyone who lived here got their fair of the beaver. So everyone got fed, no one went hungry. And this was our way of uh, taking care of each other. So this dish with one spoon encapsulated a way of us uh, looking after each other, taking care of each other, standing up for one another and uh, that, that, that was a treaty that was supposed to be to, uh, into perpetuity, so, so they say. Well, what happened was that the, the French and the British arrived. They understand that we had this treaty, and so they want to become part of the treaty. So they asked if they could become uh, part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. And so the, uh, the, the Algonquian language family, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, uh, Odawa, Potawatomi, Shawnee, uh, all these Algonquian people who came together with the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, the, 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 the Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Seneca, Mohawk people, they all came, came together and they decided to let the French become part of this treaty as well as the British. And so when that happens, a special protocol takes place where we build a rafter. It's called building a rafter, meaning we are going to include these people as part of the treaty. So they are now partners of this treaty, which means they have responsibilities. They have uh, responsibilities and a role to uphold this treaty and to live by it and abide by it. Well, the uh, French and the British did not do that. They uh, violated the treaty and they began the fur trade, and they began the extermination of the beaver. So by 1630, they say, the beaver population was pretty much decimated, pretty much extinct. And so uh, that ended the, 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 that pretty much ended the fur trade when there was no more beaver left. So the, the French uh, allied themselves with the Algonquian language family, who were the uh, the Huron, the uh, Anishinaabe, who, the other uh, Algonquian language family speakers, and the British allied themselves with the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois language speakers. So uh, both the both of these indigenous language families were good hunters. So they were really good at gathering and getting getting the pelts of beaver. And so the influence of uh, of um, arms rifles, the influence of alcohol, the influence of uh, Christianity, the influence of money. Um, this, these influences began to infiltrate the indigenous peoples because we'd never had that here. And so as a result, that was the beginning of colonization. And so uh, we slowly became colonized 
And that was an opportune time for the French and the British to start to uh, have what we call treaty making relationships with us. And slowly, this whole Great Lakes watershed uh, began to be uh, partitioned off and uh, various land surrenders. Now, what's, you, what's interesting about that is that in our language, there's no such word as surrender. Not in any of the Haudenosaunee languages, the Iroquois languages, not in any of the Algonquian languages, not in any of the Lakota, the, the Plains languages, or the West Coast languages, do we have a word for surrender. It's totally a European concept. And so uh, they, they, and they, the, the French and the British both wanted us to surrender our land. And we couldn't do that because we didn't know what that meant. So they asked us, well, do you have a word in your language that kind of reflects something similar to surrender? Well, we couldn't, we couldn't find a word that really accurately uh, is synonymous with the word surrender. So in our languages, we found a word that kind of is similar uh, in a way, uh, because uh, we are we are a sharing people. So we said that under these uh, treaty arrangements, we would share our land. We would not surrender it, we would share it. And so that was the arrangement, that was the relationship that we had, that we would share the land. And so we thought that they would honor that and, sh and let us share the land. And in return for certain treaty entitlements, they would get to live on our land, okay? And so, but, so the treaty entitlements uh, we're still dealing with today because the Supreme Court of Canada is dealing with uh, a lot of these, the spirit of the treaties, and the treaties are very, very important, but the, the indigenous ancestors knew how important these treaties were going to be, so they made sure that our people would always be taken care of, and that meant they would always have access to the medicine chest, which was health care. They would always have access to um, hunting and fishing in their territory so that they could always hunt and fish as they needed to because there was enough, there was lots of uh, natural wildlife for them to live with and they had a good relationship with hunting and fishing and gathering. Uh, they had, uh, uh, they had, they made sure that we had uh, tax immunity so that because we didn't have we didn't understand money money was not something that was something that we did so uh, commercialization commodification was something that was totally foreign again so uh, we said that we wanted to make sure that we were tax we would have tax immunity we would never have to charge tax and as we all know that uh, the Europeans brought over this uh, taxation uh, with fair representation, so everyone was was taxed, and so they brought that over here, and they wanted us to be taxed, and we said no, that's not something that we 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 will do because it's not something that we've ever done, and it's not it's not it doesn't come from here from this land. We have to have uh, respect for this this land. So uh, those were the basic uh, treaty entitlements that were uh, acknowledged. And so as long as those treaty entitlements were protected, then the British and the French could live here. And that's, and that's the way, that was the relationship. So to this day, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're living in that kind of arrangement. So that's a little bit of, that's a little bit of history of what um, took place here when the, the British and the French arrived. And w w one interesting point about all of that is that um, when we sat down, to make our treaties and to negotiate those uh, arrangements of coexistence, uh, we asked them, where are their women? Where are your women? Our women are right here because our women have the role and responsibility for the land. They have the role and responsibility for the, for the homes. They have the role and responsibility for the families, the children. They have the role and responsibility for the yield from the land. So that meant they and everything that came off the land, like the, the hunt or the harvest, the women had the responsibility to make sure that it was it was passed on to everybody, so that everyone got some and everyone got to eat and everyone everyone was sustained. So 
But the British didn't have any women because they didn't have that. In fact, women over in Europe were considered chattel, which is a Greek term for property. So women were considered property of the men. And when they saw that we had women, uh, we had gender equity, basically, when they, we, when they saw that we had women who had roles and responsibilities and had power, then uh, they didn't like that. So when they began to uh, uh, colonize us further with the use of, uh, of money, alcohol, Christianity, uh, gambling, um, those are the, there's one more influence, but those are the four main ones. I can't think of the fifth one. Anyways, uh, so we slowly succumbed to uh, letting uh, or negotiating treaties and uh, not negotiating treaties, but we slowly succumbed to letting them pass laws against us uh, that we didn't agree to, such as the Indian Act. Oh. So the uh, Indian Act was uh, enacted in 1876. It's still with us today. It's a piece, it's a piece of very uh, misogynistic, uh, racist, sexist um, uh, legislation. And um, it's uh, slowly, it's being slowly dismantled because, uh, because of those uh, uh, areas of the Indian Act that are very uh, uh, wrong. Um, very in, inhumane, dehumanizing. So in any, in any case, uh, we ended up here in London. And uh, now from what I understand from Gabor, the, uh, there, were, there were not only Huron people here, but who is the other people that were also here? Oh yeah, the, the, no, the, 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 the Huron, the Wyandotte, yeah, the Wyandotte. It was the Huron Wyandotte who were here, and they were also agricultural people. So they, there was corn. There was there was miles and miles of corn all around here, and that's and that sustained everybody. And so uh, John Graves Simcoe thought that this would be a great place to create the capital of what was then Upper Canada. And so in 1793, he declared uh, that London should be the capital. And so he went on back to uh, Fort York, which was Toronto. Uh, Toronto, by the way, is a it's a it's a Seneca word meaning the 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 the, the trunk in the water, and that's uh, right by the uh, the Don the Don River on Lake Ontario on Lake Ontario's lakefront. So I'll have to uh, we we do this all the time. I try to speak over the trains or the planes, but. Um, Let's uh, let's okay. Let's let's bring it forward to uh, the 1990s, when uh, we've already started to experience a renaissance, where indigenous peoples uh, have started to wake up, because uh, one of our our prophets, by the name of Louis Riel, who was Métis, uh, said that my people will sleep for a hundred years, and it will be the artists who will wake them up. And uh, uh, we don't have a word for art. There's no such word for art in any of our language or any of our language families. Like when I, when I refer to language families, I'm referring to about 13 language families in all of North America, okay? Just to give you an idea, in Europe, there were seven language families. Oh no, I'm sorry, there were five language families in Europe. In all of Africa, there were seven language families in all of Africa. So that gives you a little idea of the diversity here because the language comes from the land, okay? And that gives you an idea of how diverse the land is here in North America. So the, the, the diversity of the land is reflected in the diversity of the languages that are spoken. And so because our languages come from the land, uh, we, 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 we spoke different languages coming from different areas throughout uh, North America. We call it Turtle Island. So uh, to this day, we, uh, uh, we have had uh, a renaissance of artists like uh, Jeremy Dutcher, who's this uh, opera singer, 
who has been singing songs of his uh, Maliseet ancestors, and he created uh, uh, a CD from uh, music that came from wax cylinders that uh, he, he recorded. And he recorded those that music from the wax cylinders, and he added his operatic uh, voice uh, to it, and he came up with a, a winning CD. And that CD won the Polaris Music Prize, and it also won the Juno last year. So, um, uh, so the artists have woken us up. It's attributable, attributable, attributable directly to the artists for our people waking up, challenging our notions of our of the colonization that we've been through, and actually challenging the actual colonization that we're living under to this day. And the uh, as we found out from the the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the cultural genocide that we've been living under to this day, the assimilation that we've been living under to this day, um, even the um, missing murdered indigenous women and girls report also reflected uh, a cultural genocide. And these are, you have to remember, the, the, the definition of genocide is pretty hard to, to pin down, but there's five uh, definitions for the term genocide according to the United Nations and indigenous peoples of, of both Canada and the United States actually are, uh, have, have suffered uh, the, the actual definition, the United Nations definition. In fact, I think it was Martin Luther King who said that Canada and the United States were founded upon the genocide of the indigenous people. So, uh, but let's, let's just bring it forward to where now we are coexist, starting to try to coexist the best that we can, especially after uh, the, the past couple of weeks of the Black, Li Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement, and the uh, advent of the uh, of these uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Missing Murdered Indigenous, indigenous Women, um, some of the uh, the uh, the the inhumane uh, police brutality that we see directed against indigenous peoples. Like most people aren't aware that the RCMP began with the Northwest Mounted Police who were formed protect, to protect one of the major corporations of Canada at the time, which was the Hudson Bay Company. And so the Northwest Mounted Police were established to keep native people, indigenous peoples under control and not let them uh, uh, treat the Hudson Bay Company, shall we say, treat, not, not to treat them unfairly. And so, uh, that, and so we still have uh, the, the Northwest Mounted Police in why they were formed uh, with the RCMP today, the way the, and the way the RCMP and the relationships with indigenous peoples still exist in, the, in many respects, according to the founding. So uh, today though, uh, we have contributed a lot of our way of thinking, a lot of our way of life. Uh, for example, in this particular territory, we have the Anishinaabe people who, who live according to seven grandfather teachings. And those seven grandfather teachings are courage, love, respect, truth, honesty, humility, wisdom, okay? So these are the seven laws of this area. These laws, if we live by these laws, then we will live into perpetuity, side by side. And all we all have to do is live according to these laws. Now, uh, right across the rest of Canada, those, they have traditional, traditional laws that they live by and that suited them in their particular territory that they lived in on Turtle Island. So um, I just wanna bring you up to uh, the present day where we had uh, uh, the Governor General Romeo LeBlanc declare 19, in 1996, uh, June 21st as being National Aboriginal Day, okay? Now the term Aboriginal uh, wasn't a term that we were very happy with because if you look at the term Aboriginal, the prefix of the word Aboriginal is AB, AB. 
And the prefix detracts from who we really are. We are the original people. So that would be a term that accurately reflects who we are, the original people of North America. But we, uh, we all have a name that we call ourselves. We all have a name that we reflect, we refer to ourselves. And usually it's a word that translates to original human being or people like my, in my language, we say Anandagwa. And that means people of the hills. So I came from the mountains of uh, Allegheny in uh, Western New York, in uh, Pennsylvania. That's where my people originally came from, from. But because we were living in the mountains, you couldn't, it wasn't very, we couldn't practice our agricultural gifts. So we came up here to the Great Lakes watershed where it's very fertile for agricultural life. So we did it, we, we came up here to live in summertime so that we could harvest or plant our gardens and harvest them and then uh, share share the, the the yield so that everyone got fed and everyone was everyone was taken care of. So the uh, that's that the Iroquois people were agricultural people. So when we refer to ourselves, we're usually referring to ourselves something to say about the land or that would be orig the original human being. So uh, I, in my language, I would say a word like Angwehowe, which means original human being in the Onondaga language. Um, uh, in, in Edwards, Galihinde's uh, language, they say Onyanta Aga. Onyanta Aga means uh, people of the standing stone. Uh, there, there, it wouldn't be Oneida. It would be their, their, the respectful way to refer to them would be Onyanta Ag. Uh, but but that sometimes that's hard to say, so they say Oneida. So, but they are the people of the Standing Stone. And they are members of the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, uh, uh, Onwehoe Longhouse Confederacy, the Great Law of Peace. So, um, and so you have the, the Haudenosaunee people living here, and you have the Anishinaabek, uh, Anishinaabek, Potawatomi, Odawa, um, Algonquian, and those are members of the Algonquian language family. Now the Algonquian language family were hunter-gatherers. So they hunted, they gathered, and they required a lot of land in which to do that. So they, they, they pretty much lived on land all the way from the Atlantic Ocean right across to the Rocky Mountains because they followed the, the, the animals. They followed the, the, the natural uh, life. And uh, so they required a lot of land to, to be able to do that and survive. So that's why, the, that's why you have Algonquian language family people who can understand people on the East Coast, the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and they can understand people on the, on, in the Rocky Mountains speak uh, uh, Soto or they speak uh, Cree and but they understand each other or Ojibwe they all understand each other because they're the same language family but it's just that the dialects are a little different okay so but basically they're, just, they're the same language family so right here in London you have two language families you have the Haudenosaunee and you have the Algonquian and we live side by side because we had the Dish With One Spoon Treaty here at one time. At one point though, we, uh, we began to um, have differences because of the fur trade. And the fur trade colonized us and pitted us against each other to see who could get more beaver pelts. And so we ended up fighting each other and that was, that was not a good thing. In fact, it was very contrary to Dish with one spoon. So uh, it wasn't until we realized that we were, we had the dish with one spoon that we actually should be uniting. We should be coming together and we should be having a common front and speaking with one voice about how we see our, ourselves living in uh, coexistence with our non NATO brothers and sisters. And we always, like, we would never ever dispossess anyone of their homes because we know what that feels like. We've had that happen to us for a couple hundred years. So we know that that's not a good feeling. So we would never do that to anybody. 
but we are involved in some land claims, and uh, the, the land claims are basically uh, resolving a lot of these issues, and uh, we're having to deal with the, the original spirit of the land claims, and I mean, original spirit of the treaties, because the original spirit of the treaties always dealt with uh, courage, love, respect, truth, honesty, humility, and wisdom, always respect with, uh, always uh, dealt with the, uh, the good mind, the good heart, uh, the good uh, the good words. Um, in the, uh, the Iroquois way, you know, we, we have a way that uh, we talk about um, peace amongst all people. We talk about the power of unity, the unity of all the people. When you have the unity of all the people, then you have power. That is power. And then the righteousness of all the people. And the righteousness of all the people is the welfare of all the people coming together, taking care of each other, looking after each other, much like this uh, pandemic has uh, created so that we are looking after and taking care of each other and looking out for one another. So with those uh, words, I think, uh, Mary Lou, would you like to sing a drum song? We're going to start off today. I just want to see while Marilyn is getting ready, we have the sun right above us, uh, almost right above us. Now we try to do our ceremonies when the sun is right above us. I explained this one time when we were over at the uh, Wood Street Park there. And the purpose of doing the ceremonies when the, sun, when the sun is above us is that the eldest brother, when he shines on us, we don't cast much of a shadow, okay? And it is said that in our shadow, we can ha we can hide a hidden agenda. Okay, and so we don't want to hide, and we don't have any hidden agendas. We want the Creator, and we want all the our spirit helpers, and all of our uh, uh, the natural world. We want them to witness what we're doing here today, and what we're doing here is we're celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day along with our non-native brothers and sisters who have come to join us. We welcome Bindigan, everyone, here to the circle today. And we always begin with the purification smudging ceremony. And what this ceremony does is it allows us to uh, purify our mind, body, and spirit. And it actually is a medicine. It's proven that it does actually heal. It, it does actually have properties of healing that are good that are uh, very positive. And, and I was just reading an article about sage, how, the, how the, the science of sage actually does work. Now it's, it's interesting because we, we always knew that. So, and it was always in our, uh, in our stories, our orality. And our, our orality has always been here. And science is just starting, just beginning to catch up to our orality. So, it's, so the things that we've been saying are being proven true s slowly over time. And, and that's, that's a good thing because we are becoming of one mind. We're starting to unite our mind, bodies, and spirit. So is uh, Don gonna take this around? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right, I smudged. Okay. Okay, so Mary Lou's gonna sing this drum song and uh, she'll introduce it. And how um, scientists, just today I read on Facebook, one of my friends posted this, that today scientists now agree with what we Native people have been saying for thousands of years, that we need water to survive. And I remember when I was just a kid, I'd hear people saying, oh, it's just water. You know, like, what are you worried about? You know, it's always going to be there, but it's not always going to be there and unless we do something about it. Um, Dan and I travel quite a bit, and so we have the opportunity of flying over uh, different countries and, uh, you know, from the United States to Canada. And we, we get close to, uh, like, Minnesota. There's so many lakes. It's just so beautiful. And in Michigan, there's so many lakes. In Ontario, it's just beautiful. When we get close to cities like Toronto or Boston, you can see the water is brown, and the closer you get to civilization, it's black. So that's not good, you know. Um, so we have to, um, so 
for the next seven generations, we have to make sure that that water is going to be good for the seven generations to follow after that. Otherwise, there will not be an existence here on Earth. I predict that one day only the rich people will be able to live in cities because they'll be able to afford to buy water, bottled water and they'll be uh, able to afford to purchase hydro, which is something that you need for your little games and your um, little laptops and your all those, those other little tablet things. I have a tablet. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> I'd be, I would love to go live back up north and block the land. <clears throat> Dan and I often go uh, fasting up at a place called Thunder Mountain we're groups of people, like uh, maybe 40 people, will all come and gather, and each one of us will set up our own camping site. And then um, we usually have a, a community kitchen, and the women, you know, go in and cook because the women are good cooks, right? And so the men will go and chop the wood, and you know, everybody knows that they have a responsibility to take care of when they're in that camp. And the most important thing is how much we care for each other, just like how we are all caring for each other during this COVID. You know, so I would love to live like that, you know, all the time, you know, where we're just worried about one another and um, just concerned that uh, people are taking care of everybody. We've had so many people come, to, you know, call us up and send emails saying, do you need anything, you know, and somebody would drop off a couple dozen eggs at the door and somebody would bring some bread and then somebody would bring some juice for Dan, you know, and so, that's the way it was a long time ago um, on reserves and in small communities. The people would go and visit the old people to make sure they were okay. They would make sure that they had water. They made sure that they had wood for their fires, you know, and so we should get back into that, you know, because that's the most important thing, I think, is that when you feel good inside here, <clears throat> then <clears throat> you have that good energy to put out there and you can create goodness all around you with that good energy. So. Um, I'd like us to sing the water song. A lot of people know this song, and it's a pretty simple song. Um, after a verse or two, you'll you'll get the hang of it. Um, I sing it on YouTube, so you just key in my name, Mary Lou Sook, and I sing um, a couple of verses at Harborfront from um, about 10 years ago, I guess. So um, my voice is kind of scratchy because I was uh, under the weather for a little bit, but um, when these things happen, I kind of sound like Janis Joplin, but not in a good way, so please bear me. Bear with me. <clears throat> Wichita, do ya, do ya, do ya. Wichita, do ya, do ya, hey. Wichita, do ya, do ya, do ya. Wichita, do ya, do ya, hey. Hey, I tonight, yeah, hey, yeah, hey. Hey, I tonight, Well, 
I just said Matakewasan, and that means all my relations in the Lakota language. I discovered part of my lineage as I was aging. Um, I didn't always know who I was. Uh, when I was a little girl, um, I knew I was uh, Ojibwe, and I knew my grandfather had some French blood in him, and that's all I knew. As I got older, I found out that my father um, was half Lakota and half Ojibwe. During the turn of the century in Sault Ste. Marie, they were known as the half-breeds because of that mixture of blood. <clears throat> and then about 20 years ago, I discovered that I had this um, Mi'kmaq blood. So I figured out my lineage that it was uh, five parts Ojibwe, one part Lakota, one part Mi'kmaq, and one part French. I had discovered that my French ancestor arrived from France out by Gaspé around uh, 1642, and he was a circuit judge, and he married a Mi'kmaq woman from a place outside of Gaspé called uh, Gascopedia. And so he tried cases in the area for several years, then they moved to Nova Scotia, and they stayed in Nova Scotia for a couple hundred years. And then my grandfather ventured up north, and he met my grandmother up around Sudbury, around Manitoulin Island area. So that's where my lineage comes from. So um, Dan and I go to a lot of ceremonies, and the Iroquois people have eight major ceremonies, and we try to get to them at the Longhouse. In fact, we were married in the Onondaga Longhouse in 1977. And our wedding was taped in the longhouse, and it was the very first time that a camera was allowed inside the longhouse. So we still have that that tape. I'm going to get it uh, put onto a disc, but uh, you know, if somebody wants to come and watch it sometime, you're welcome to do that. So we go to the um, the Mi'kmaq ceremonies. We've gone out there to the east, and we have dance the sun dances, and we have um, done ceremonies with the Medewin people and our own Ojibwe ceremonies. And to honor my French side, well, sometimes I have French fries. And sometimes if I'm on a train, I order a baguette and I use my accent. And the waiter is impressed. And so um, I get to uh, honor all my, um, all my layers of um, blood in me. But what's really interesting was when Deanna and I were out in, in the East, in the Mi'kmaq country, we were asked to go out there to activate some drums, to do, do some storytelling for the youth, and to um, help build a sweat lodge and help with a powwow that was happening. So the powwow was a whole weekend. And so we were there for the week before that. So we had these activities to fill up our time. And so um, we, we did some storytelling with youth and teepees and we activated their drums. And on the day that it was time to build a sweat lodge, uh, about 15 members of the community came out and they were all uh, willing to help and they all knew what to do. And like Dan and I knew, knew what to do because we've helped build SWAT lodges before. And there was a couple tables lying around the area and on one table was a great big stainless steel bowl. And so I said to myself, you know, like there's so many people here, they're not gonna miss me. I had seen raspberry bushes and I had seen blueberry bushes. So while everybody else was, uh, you know, bending the, the wood to build the sweat lodge, you know, and, you know, making the holes and all that, I was out and I filled that bowl up in no time at all. So a few years go by and then uh, we meet um, through our friend, Pat, who lives here in London. She grew up in St. Catharines and she had these, um, this family who had discovered they had native blood. And the first thing they wanted to do after, you know, finding out, a little bit of knowledge about that was they wanted to go to ceremonies. So she connected them to us. And so um, we had dinner at her house and um, I met the three brothers came out. Uh, their last name was Collins. And so we always refer to them as the Collins brothers. And so uh, they were telling me, you know, that they, uh, they came from out east and, um, you know, that I think they got registered at um, Algonquin country or something like that, but that's not important to the story. So anyway, um, they left and then I was talking to Pat and I said, gee whiz, I wanted to tell him about my grandfather because my grandfather said that he was a Frenchman. He would not admit to being native though he looked native. So <clears throat> he was Acadian. He would admit to being Acadian and the Acadians came from out east. So I immediately knew that connection after talking to the Collins brothers. And I said to Pat, I said, gee whiz, I wanted to tell him about my grandfather and I forgot. <clears throat> So we had told the Collins brothers about going up to Thunder Mountain to fast. 
And so we met them up there a couple of weeks later and they had everything they needed. And so uh, she must have told Jay, the oldest uh, brother, about our conversation. So he came up to me and he said, what's your grandfather's name? So I said, well, my grandfather's name is Bromie Dugas. And so Jay goes, we're related, we're cousins. And he's the one that found out that my, our relative was, you know, came over from France around uh, four, uh, 1642. And so right then I was thinking about when Dana and I were helping to build that salt lodge and then I went and picked all those berries. And then I got chills up and down my spine because I realized that I had experienced blood memory. I knew where those berries were because my grandmother from many years back picked those berries. So I had that blood memory. So I was absolutely blown away by that, you know, because in the 90s, when uh, Maria Campbell wrote a book called Half Breed, she talks about um, blood memory. And anybody you talk to who knew about that book and uh, Maria Campbell, and you talk, if you said, do you, do you know about blood memory? Everybody goes, oh yeah, sure, of course. You know, I experience it all the time. But you know, you don't, a lot of people were telling untruth. <laughs> But I, like I really experienced it, and so it was just um, it was such an absolutely amazing feeling, and you know like all our people have that ability, and we carry that blood from our ancestors from the beginning of time here in this land, and so that's why um, there's so much uh, intergenerational trauma going on because of what happened to our people since you know the late 1400s when um, what we call the invasion happened. You know, we were helpful um, when when the boats came over and landed on our beaches. They were dying from scurvy. We made them cedar tea. We nursed them to health, and then they still were awful to us. So <clears throat> we have to change the population and change the population how they think. We have to use the seven grandfather teachings, like what Dan was talking about. The very first, most important one is respect. Second, I think, is love. You know, when you have love in your heart, you have kindness. And kindness is not um, a seven grandfather's teaching, but kindness is one of the greatest gifts that the Anishinaabe people have in their hearts, is that kindness. So, you know, if we can learn to walk together, we can do ceremonies to clean that water. Dan and I have um, <clears throat> been with um, this scientist called, uh, what's his name, Dr. Um, Dr. Mazuru Umoto. He came to Toronto and we um, sat in on a lecture that he gave and he proved to the world that you can talk and you can heal water. He froze water and so he showed pictures of water, like of dirty water and it was frozen and <clears throat> under the microscope it looked like uh, dirty snowflakes. So him and his staff would say kind words to the water you know, would say, you know, like you are really good water and, you know, like you are uh, very beneficial to the world, you know, and we need you and you're, you're very healing. And they said all these kind words to the water and then they kept taking pictures of it. And <clears throat> finally the water became clean because of the good energy that they put out there. So I feel that if we went to the water and went like around one of the Great Lakes, it would take a lot of planning because it's going to take a lot of people and a lot of organization. But we could talk to that water and we could heal it. But we have to be of one mind and we have to want to do it. Not so Nestle can bottle it and sell it like they're doing, you know, but for the, for the, um, so that the people, the generations to come can have that water, you know, so we have to do that. So we always like to um, sing songs um, and all the songs that we sing, we learned in the Sut Lodge. So that meant, um, like, I remember the first time I went to the Sweat Lodge and I heard a song. As soon as I got home, I started writing the tra la las and I uh, yada yadas. And then two days later, I didn't have a clue what it meant. So I had to keep going back, you know, to learn the songs because way back then, um, you couldn't find them on YouTube. But nowadays, you can. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we really enjoyed going to Sweat Lodges. Uh, in the 90s, we went to Sweat Lodge every week out in Guelph. Um, we had two teachers, one was Vern Harper and the other teacher was Joe Couture. And um, they were very good to us and they helped Dan and I because Dan and I had experienced a tragedy in the 70s when we lost twin daughters. And so our life was hell. And um, we, um, you know, in, that, in those days, there was no place for us to go to get help. 
and we didn't want to go to a church to get help because they had like places for counseling and stuff like that but the church had done a lot of negative things to our people so we didn't um we didn't go there and then they say when the student is ready the teacher will appear one day we ran into Vern Harper and he said we're having a sweat lodge this New Year's Eve I want you to come out and it turns out it was a blue moon sweat and we went out there and that's when we started on our sweat lodge journey um, I had been in a sweat lodge when I was 19 years old on Manitoulin Island and Dan had been in a sweat lodge when he was 20 it was on his 20th birthday he was in a sweat lodge in New York State in the is it the Catskills is that where you were so we had a earlier experience but it wasn't until uh, 1989 the very last um, day of the year that we went back to the lodge and so everybody at the lodge helped us to heal and uh, recover and they helped us to function so part of the the whole part of the whole um, thing was learning because we didn't know these teachings our, our ceremonies were um, were stolen our, our our ceremonies were smothered. Um, our elders and the old people kept our ceremonies alive when we were placed on reservations. The, um, what do you call that? The, the Indian agent, he would uh, have a basic nine to five job where he had to keep us on the reserve. And we had to have a note if we wanted to come into town to say sell some tomatoes or buy some yard goods. And if we didn't have that note, we could get thrown in jail. So his job was to, uh, you know, keep us under his thumb. So at night, when the Indian agent was sleeping, our people went way back in the bush, and they did the ceremonies. And nobody heard them because they were like a mile back in the bush. And so they were singing and yelling and whooping and screaming when it got too hot. And you know, and they they kept those ceremonies alive. When I was 17 years old, I had this opportunity to travel out west to Morley, Alberta, and that's when all the old elders brought out their sacred items. They had uh, great big, huge blankets um, wrapped around medicine that they carried out. And they had drums and um, they had um, everything you needed for ceremonies. And they brought that out and they shared that with all the people who came out. And that's why those ceremonies were still alive at those times because they kept them alive by doing them in the middle of the night. And so um, I was really fortunate to be a part of that um, immersion of them coming forth again. And so, um, also I love to sing, you know, <laughs> so we have so many songs. <clears throat> so the song, um, I'm just gonna sing some easy songs today. This song is um, <clears throat> a song that um, Fern and Dan would sing in the sweat lodge when the lodge was new. And um, so we had just started going there and then but they would introduce a song and then they'd say, okay, Vern would say to Dan, not just Dan, another Dan, <clears throat> it would say, Dan, uh, sing the rock song. So Dan would sing the rock song and then they'd do, you know, around in the sweat lodge and then Vern would talk <clears throat> and then uh, Vern would say, Dan, sing the Eagle song. And then Dan would sing the exact same song because they didn't know any songs. So it was kind of funny. <laughs> But that was the first song that we learned in the lodge. <clears throat> My voice is going. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> this is called the rock song. Way high, high, way high, high, way high, high, ho.
another song um, just so I can tell you about my sister Debbie. Um, my sister Debbie was uh, murdered in Toronto in 1997. The police didn't investigate her murder. They didn't fingerprint. They put the tape around her room and um, you know that says police investigation do not cross and um, as soon as they took my sister's body out of her room that she rented in a boarding house um, the landlord came and ripped the tape down and threw all my sister's stuff in a dumpster and rented the room out like the next day or the day of. So my sister's murder was never investigated. So um, we went through a lot of trauma with that and our so much family helped us to go through that and they all came out and uh, supported us and we sang songs and you know and Bruin Harper um, did the funeral for my uh, sister and you know it's just how our family is you know like when we're in ceremony we're a family you know so um, that's why I think that kind of life is the best way of life but my sister's favorite song was the Cherokee morning song <clears throat> so we're gonna sing that song if you know let's sing along okay <clears throat> through the clouds and she just peeked out at us when I was singing that song so she's very happy 
So don't worry, Nana. So I'm going to pass this over to Dan. Okay, I think uh, at this time I'm going to share with you. Uh, normally, these are the words that are said before all others. And uh, these uh, are what we call our Thanksgiving, our Thanksgiving address. And the Thanksgiving address always begins our healing circles, our talking circles, our uh, classes. When Mary Lou taught, and I taught up at uh, Brescia University College and at uh, on main campus from 2006 to 16, we always began with this with this Thanksgiving address, then a drum song. But we always, and, and we always began with the purification smudging ceremony. But uh, this, uh, I think people started to understand this uh, Thanksgiving because uh, we always begin with the uh, the water, which is the most lowest uh, feminine. It's a feminine sacred element of life, of life that all creation needs in order to survive. So we always begin with the water because water is very, very important. And as Mary Lou explained, um, I think our generation is going to be the last generation that can actually go up into the mountains and drink water from a stream you know, from a glacial stream, or go to a place where it's so isolated that you can drink the water right out of the lake, you know. Um, I don't think we're, we're, any of the ensuing generations will be able to do that. So right now, is, uh, the water is very precious, and it's, that's why we, we, co we call it the, the, that feminine sacred element of life that all creation needs in order to survive. So we'll begin with the, um, with the water. Uh, the water is the uh, lifeblood life of our mother, the earth. Uh, looks after all creation, takes care of everything. Um, everything needs it in order to live. So water is very important. And water uh, looks after the penguins and the swimmers. It's, uh, it's uh, very, very sacred. Uh, and uh, we always acknowledge the water as being the lifeblood. But water is still still following her sacred instructions. She's still providing life to all creation. So we want to give greetings, give credit, give thanks to the water. The water is still following her sacred instructions. Next we go to the earth. The earth here, uh, our mother earth, uh, is uh, also uh, another feminine sacred element of life that all creation needs in order to survive. Nothing would survive without the, with the earth. So we want to acknowledge all the crawlers in the earth, all the four-leggeds that live in the earth, the uh, two-leggeds, us, us two-leggeds, us human beings, uh, the plant beings, the, uh, the, the trees, the rocks, the minerals, all the life that lives in the trees, all the life that lives on the trees. It was, it was nice to see the, uh, the groundhog, the four-legged, coming to uh, see our, our gathering here. So we, all of this, this creation is a life support system that is interrelated, interconnected uh, to uh, taking care of our mother, the earth, uh, all this life. So we want to give greetings, give thanks that the earth and all this creation is still taking care of our mother, the earth, and that our mother, the earth is still following her sacred instructions, grandfather, grandmother, so be it in our minds. We also want to give greetings, give thanks to our Father Sky. Our Father Sky is, represents the air, and our Father Sky breathes that life into all creation. Nothing would survive without our Father Sky. So we want to always give greetings, give thanks that our Father Sky is still following his sacred instructions, grandfather, grandmother, so be it in our minds. We also want to acknowledge, uh, as Mary Lou said, her, her mother peeking out through the clouds. Uh, in our way, the, the, the sun is our eldest brother, and the sun uh, is, represents fire, and fire uh, of life is required by every form of life in creation. Nothing would survive without the, the sun, okay? That's how important the sun is, and the sun is, represent, is, is related to this fire. This fire that's been made has been made uh, usually with the ashes of a previous sacred fire, 
and that those prayers and those secret thoughts that are in those ashes are are with us in this circle here today so this uh when we begin our ceremonies we usually wait for the flame to be directly hitting or the the rays of the sun to directly hit the fire and as soon as that happens then our ceremony begins so uh we want to acknowledge uh our eldest brother the sun still following his sacred instructions and taking care of all creation we also want to acknowledge our grandmother moon uh right now we are in the old daemon jesus moon time the grandmother's strawberry moon uh, that's why we always have strawberries at our ceremonies and every time we've come to to wood, wood street park to your community here you always have strawberries available for every ceremony that we do because strawberries are the very first fruit life that comes from mother earth and so she's sacred the strawberries are sacred and so this moon time the the odaman gizes is also known as the heart berry moon so the the strawberry is named Odaemon because the strawberry is shaped like the human heart. Very much looks like the human heart. So the uh, the heart berry is the name that we give to this fruit and we give to this moon time. So we, whenever this moon time happens, we know that the strawberries are going to be ready to harvest, and they they are. And apparently they're very sweet. So we'll we'll find that out. Uh, but uh, we 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 like we like uh, coming here because we always like having strawberries with our relatives here at your, in your community. So we want to acknowledge the grandmother moon, still following her sacred instructions. Nothing would survive without the moon and the moon time. The moon she shows her face every 28 days, and when she does, she takes care of all female life. She continues to do that. And she also takes care of the water. Like when you see the water in the oceans and the lakes, the water from the bottom gets gets attracted up to the surface and the water from the surface goes down to the bottom. So the water is actually being recycled. The water is being purified, it's being cleansed. So our grandmother moon takes care of the water and she's still doing that. So we acknowledge that our grandmother moon is still following her sacred instructions, grandfather, grandmother, so be it in our minds. We also want to acknowledge the stars, the stars that you see at nighttime. The star relatives remind us when it is time for us to conduct our ceremonies, our ceremonies of Thanksgiving. In our teachings, it says, uh, the Creator says that whenever we want something to come back and repopulate this world, be it a medicine, be it a uh, a, a harvest crop, be it a fruit, whenever we want them to come back, all we have to do is give thanks and do a ceremony of thanks, thanksgiving. So that's why in our way, we have eight major ceremonies in which we give thanks. We, we, we do that throughout the course of a cycle of creation, 13 moons. And, and we have eight major ceremonies whereby we give thanks for different parts of creation. And we're, we're acknowledging, we, you know, we know that if we do that, it will come back and we'll replenish and we'll repopulate and we'll, we'll take care of us. And that's why we always do that. And we often find out too that when we do that, the gene pool is often stronger when we do that. So it's important that we do that. We always maintain our ceremonies as we are told by the stars. And we have people who, are, who can still read the cosmology, who can still read the birch bark scrolls, who can still read the wampum belts, and they can understand what our ancestors were telling us a long time ago, and that we should be remember, we should, we should be mindful of today, so that we can remember that our ancestors gave us these ceremonies so that we would do them and we would continue them to this day. So we want to just acknowledge that the star relatives are still following their sacred instructions, grandfather, grandmother, so be it in our minds. We also want to acknowledge the thunderers. The thunder beings are the ones who come here in February and they wake up the world. They shake it awake with the thunder because it's time 
to let the world know that the next cycle of creation is about to begin, and that's usually when it starts. And it usually starts with the arrival of the of the Wata, or the Enatig, which means sweet water. Wata in Haudenosaunee, Enatig in Anishinaabe. But that means sweet water, the sweet water ceremony, and that's the arrival of the maple sap. The maple sap is a medicine. And it was a medicine that we were told that if we drink a glass of it a day for one moon time, for one lunar period, it will fortify our blood, that, that sap, with magnesium, with zinc, with iron, and 50, 51, 52 other different uh, chemical, organic chemical elements that's good for us. It comes right from the earth so that we can be fortified to go out and start getting the land ready because that, that's the time when uh, we start doing that in the month of April. We start going out and tilling the land and getting it ready for planting in May. So there's a rhythm that's happening. So we, we follow this rhythm and that's why we, get, we do our ceremonies in rhythm with the cycles of creation. So the next uh, uh, entity or announcement we want to make is to the, the spirit helpers. The spirit helpers are the ones who uh, are like angels. They're, they're helpers of ceremony. They're helpers of each and every one of us. Each and every one of us has, has spirit helping us. And those spirit helpers connect with our spirit. And they guide us. And they always guide us to the right decision, especially if we're trying to make a decision that's hard to make. They, if we listen to our intuition, we will, we, will, we, we will be told the right decision to make. So we, we acknowledge the spirit helpers because they are directly created, or directly connected, I'm sorry, to the higher power. So whatever higher power you may believe in, the, the spirit helpers are directly connected to that higher power. So we acknowledge Creator, Saguenodizo, Di Geminado, uh, because that's the name that we give to the Creator, uh, that higher power, which uh, in, in the Haudenosaunee language means people of the longhouse. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it, means, it means maker of our bodies, sorry. Haudenosaunee means people of the longhouse. Saguenodizo uh, means maker of our bodies, maker of our bodies, so that they, the, the creator made all of us, put everything here for a purpose. So, and we all live according to this purpose of harmony and rhythm. So we just want to acknowledge that the creator has done everything here for us so that we could live in balance and harmony. There's nothing that we have to do in order to make, uh, make life better. Life is as perfect as it can be with what the Creator has already put here. We don't have to improve upon it, yet uh, we, we continue to try to, but we don't, it's not necessary because everything we need is right here. We don't have to go to outer space. We don't have to go, if we were, if we did have to go to outer space, there would be a way for us to get out there. But see, see so there, I mean, there, it, wasn't, it was not meant to be for us to, to go out there. So. Here, here we are, We're on Mother Earth, everything here is here, and so we don't have to go any further. It's right here. So we acknowledge uh, our higher power, Saguan Dizong, Bijam and and we acknowledge this beautiful day, this beautiful time together. And I just want to give thanks, and I just want to acknowledge our hosts, I want to acknowledge all of our guests, I want to acknowledge our, one of our fellow performers, our sister, Dawn, who's going to be performing. And I guess, are you performing now, Don? Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, is he? Oh, okay. Perfect. It's, oh, there you are, right on, Mark. Good to see you. Okay, maybe I'll just do an in, a short intro. Okay, yeah, uh, Mark is the uh, chief of the uh, Muncie, Delaware. He's the, uh, pardon? Oh yeah, do you want to do them now? Okay, Mary Lou, did you want to speak for the strip? Did you want to speak? Okay. Bonjour. Asanunas Koyan Dejnakas Makwa Dodem Bachwana Bay Dunjaba. 
My spirit name is Shooting Star Woman. I'm Bear Clan. I originally come from Batchamana Bay, Ontario. I'm very honored to be here. Dan and I have been living in this part of southwestern Ontario for um, 43 years. So it's, uh, I would say it's our home. But in our ceremonies, the women always speak for the water and they always speak for the berries. The berries is the very first food that is available after the long winter, um, you know, that grows from the earth. So it's very sacred. Um, these um, strawberries, these odamen is what they're called, um, are medicine. They're very good for your heart, they're good for your stomach, and they also taste really good. So um, we always honor the strawberry and we always, um, place a strawberry in the fire for their ancestors who are always come to the ceremonies. When we light up that smudge, that's an invitation for the unseen world to come out to where we are. And so they like to eat and this is for them. And I'm gonna ask this young lady here if she could take the strawberries around to offer them. Thank you very much, miigwech. Okay, while Don is taking the Odaman around to everybody, uh, you can just acknowledge the, uh, the Hartberry. Uh, I remember one of our elders by the name of Roger Jones from a place called, uh, uh, where was that? Shawanaga. Shawanaga. Yeah, he used to always tell us that when we get the strawberry, we should eat the green. And, and people don't want to eat the green. They always pull the green off and throw it in, down into the earth, give it back to the Mother Earth. But uh, Roger said that that's where that that's where a lot of the mineral elements are, are in the green. So uh, he he always encouraged us to eat the whole strawberry. So for 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 the strawberry ceremony, when he would do a sunrise ceremony, it wasn't a big hardship to eat uh, eat the eat the green of the strawberry. So we got used to it. And then after a while, it just became habit, eh, Marilou? We didn't even think about it. So uh, we always say that so that if you want to eat the green, go ahead and eat it. It's not going to be harmful. It's going to actually be good for you. So the strawberry has that good, those good properties in the green. So go ahead. At this time, I wanted to introduce to you uh, a friend of mine. I've known uh, Mark. Mark Peters is uh, the chief of the Muncie, Delaware Nation, just outside of London here. It's about 20, 25 minutes outside of town. And a lot of uh, Londoners don't ever, ever make it out there. And uh, that's, that's uh, I remember what, listening to a radio on, um, FM, no, no, I think maybe it was FM 96 or Radio 98, which, that, which was down at the Free Press Building. And I remember the talk show hostess was asking Joe Muskokeman, who was the chief at the time, why, why don't uh, non-native people from London go out to the reserve to visit Chippewas of the Thames, the Oneida, Onyanta Ock, or the Muncie, Delaware? And he said he, he didn't know because that, that's what they want. They would like that. They would like to have people come out and visit and get to know, get to know their neighbors. And I remember uh, when David Suzuki came here in 1992, he launched this book called Wisdom of the Elders. And that was a book that he went around the world and talked to all the elders. And he got their, he, he, he encapsulated their wisdom in this book. And he wanted to launch it here because he lived here in London. And he went to school here in London. And you know, he never set foot on either one of those three reserves either. And he could not understand it. He thought, why, I mean, there's three reserves just outside of town. Why, why did I ever go out there? And he didn't know what, what, what the reason was. So he thought, well, this year, I'm gonna, when I finish this book, I'm gonna launch it out there on those reserves. So Mary Lou and I, we went out with a friend of ours to every one of the band councils to ask them for permission 
for uh, David to come out and launch his book. And of course, they all said, sure, that'd, that'd be great. And you know, those book launches were just excellent. Uh, there, there, a lot of the people came from the community to welcome David into their community. A lot of people from London followed David in, out to those communities. So it was just a great day for uh, uh, the, 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 the two communities, the three or the four communities to come together and through David's book. So it was just interesting. Anyways, so so Mark and I, we uh, we met uh, through, I, I, w I worked with this, uh, started, we started a radio show in 1990 called Smoke Signals. And from this radio show, we began this uh, this news, uh, we wanted to start, start a newswire service called the Native News Network of Canada. And, and Mark uh, joined us. Uh, he was a uh, young lawyer and uh, we thought we, we knew that we could use uh, uh, a good legal mind to help us get started. Get our, get, as, you know, it's really hard to get uh, charitable status, so lawyers know how to do that. So, but we never did get we never did get our charitable status just because we didn't technically technically we didn't put our application together properly. So uh, it never came to pass. But um, Mark and I maintained friendship. And then um, when we when we first came together in radio, he was uh, an advocate for standing up for the water. And at that time, uh, London was proposing the Southside Sewage Treatment Plant, which some of you may remember. Southside Sewage Treatment Plant was going to be built in, in Delaware, and they had bought the land and everything. And uh, so I, I don't know what's happened to that plan. But the Southside Sewage Treatment Plant was going to treat the effluent from all the industry of London West. And, and Mark said, well, it would be over his dead body. There's no way they're going to build a, a, a sewage treatment plant out there in Delaware. There's no way, because I'll, you know, I'll be there. Anyways, as we all know, uh, Standing Rock, the Standing Rock uh, pipeline, access pipeline uh, situation, uh, uh, the indigenous people won because uh, a judge ruled in favor that the, the Army Corps of Engineers did not do the environmental assessment properly and did not uh, do a proper, go through the proper uh, consultation protocols that's necessary. And so they didn't have the right to dig underneath the, uh, the rivers there. And, uh, in, and there was a huge uh, outpouring of support from all over the world. And, you know, I envisioned that we were going to have one of those standing rock situations just out here, side here, it's a subside sewage treatment, and that mark would be there <laughs> if, if, if it happened. But from what I understand, it, it hasn't happened and it uh, didn't happen. So uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let Mark uh, say a few words. He knows about, he's been doing a podcast from his uh, community every Sunday. I've been watching it, and it's very interesting because he talks about issues that I didn't know about, about our relationship or about his relationship of his people to the Hudson Bay Company or to the Dutch people or to uh, how they ended up here because they come from originally from New Jersey, and that's where I went to university, in New Jersey. And uh, I didn't even know when I was, in, I was going to university there whose land my university was on. And then I found out that it was... Uh, uh, a nation known as the Lene Lenape. And I said, by any chance, are they also called the Delaware? And he says, yes. I says, we have them living on Six Nations, Grand River, on my reserve. So it just, it just came to pass that uh, I knew that someday I would meet up with some of the Lene Lenape. And of course, I met up with uh, Bud White. I was on our Native News Network of Canada. And then I met up with you and, and others. And then I became friends. And uh, over the years, uh, we just cultivated that friendship. So I'm going to let uh, Mark say a few words about uh, his podcast. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dan. It's really uh, nice to have been invited here, actually. Uh, whenever I get a call from Dan and Mary Lou, I answer that right away, and I'm happy to come here today and uh, see them again and everybody here. Uh, I should let you know, the Southside Pollution Control Plant, it wasn't the location of it as much as the outlet 
of it. It was going to come out at a place called Giles Bridge, just one mile up the river from our three reserves. And it would have pumped 70 million gallons of effluent into the river every day, a mile up from us. So that was the issue, really. And the City of London decided to stop that and uh, upgrade the green, green, and I think it's called a greenway uh, pollution control plant so that yeah we were able as a group to to prevent that from happening and having to go down and chain ourselves to bulldoze and, and stuff like that but anyway uh yeah i've been doing a, a live facebook history of our community over the past well i've done nine sessions so far and I'm at the year 1674, got a long ways to go. But I did a few notes for today's uh, discussion, and uh, it's going to take a little while to go through this, so I hope everybody's uh, okay with about a half hour or so. Uh, I just want to talk about the Muncie, Delaware Nation. We uh, presently live on the Thames River, also known as the Dushkanzibi by the Chippewas, just west of London, uh, uh, on the other side of the town of Delaware. And there's something to how that town got its name, but we don't have time for that. We've been uh, residing on the Thames River since about 1783, at the end of the American Revolution, actually. Uh, we moved to the Thames with the consent of the local Chippewas, as well as what was known as the Western Confederacy of Indian Nations, of all the Indian nations in the Great Lakes area back in the 1770s and 1780s. And we also moved here on the promise of a treaty with the British government based on our alliance with the British during the American Revolution. Uh, however, before we moved to the Thames, we were actually from a long way away, some 800 miles from this area. We are from uh, the area, if you know where the Delaware River is in Pennsylvania, the whole Delaware water, River watershed from its source to its mouth over to the Hudson River watershed from the city of Kingston, New York, all the way down to its mouth, including northern New Jersey, Manhattan Island, Staten Island, and western Long Island. These are the lands known as Lenape Hoking. It's a rather large area, and that contact, it included probably at least 60 different Muncie-speaking villages. And, uh, these villages were all separate and autonomous self-governing communities. We didn't really have a central government overseeing all of the Muncie-speaking peoples, uh, but when it came necessary, we were able to do that. Uh, there was another group known as the Unami south of us, and then the Unalategos on the ocean. And together, these three groups of people made up what's known as, Dan mentioned, the Lene Lenape. And the Lene Lenape are also known as the Delawares. We became known as the Delawares in the 1660s after an English captain with the name D. Lawar in his very long title sailed into the Delaware Bay and called the area Delaware. And the native people living along the Delaware River became known as the Delawares. And for some reason, we seem to have liked this name and adopted it and continued to use it even until today. But just so you know, the, De the word Delaware is not really a native word. It's an English, the name of an English sea captain, believe it or not. But like I say, we have a tendency to adopt names that we like and uh, this wasn't the last time we did that. You know, you might wonder, well, this is a pretty large area. There's a lot of people here. How long did we live there for? And I'll tell you, 
it's we lived there for quite a long time from what I've been able to find out. There's something uh there's a Delaware legend called the legend of the Yaquawi. And it talks about how the people and the animals joined together in a great battle against the Yaquawi, which was also known as the Mastodon. And in that battle, the Mastodon got stuck in the bogs and they were killed in these bogs. And the bogs ran red with blood and cranberries grew in these bogs. And the cranberries are red to remind people of the greatness of this battle between all of the people and the animals and the Aquawi or the Mastodon. And this is quite an incredible legend, really. It was recorded by a man in the late 1800s from speaking with Delaware people who still had these memories that they went by. The thing about this legend is that the mastodons actually went extinct about 8,000 years ago. So it kind of makes you wonder how this legend could have got handed down over all this time and whether there's even any truth to it. But how could there be a legend about a mastodon unless the people were actually there? And archaeological evidence actually does back this legend up because at the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania, there's evidence that people have been there up to 19,000 years ago. And at the Shawnee Minisink site, and Minisink is another word for Muncie, uh, there's evidence that people were there up to 11,000 years ago. And at this time, the actual glaciers that covered half of North America actually came down to about the, uh, to Manhattan Island and stopped there. So these glaciers were about a mile or two high. There was mastodons, mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, even the horse, giant beavers, all these prehistoric fauna, they call them, that, that roamed this neighborhood. And people were there. And people were, uh, they were probably what they call big game hunters and gatherers. They people that knew how to survive in the most extreme weather. They must have known how to sew things together to make clothing, to make shelter. So, you know, this story goes back a long, long ways. And uh, the archaeological evidence again uh, over the thousands of years shows a continuing occupation of this area as well as a development in the area of weapons and tools and cooking stuff, things made out of stones that that don't uh, disintegrate over time. And I should uh, mention also before I get going on that there's been over, there's been hundreds of these mastodon remains found in bogs in the New Jersey and New York area. So, you know, this legend about the, the Yaquawis really something else I think uh, but probably about 1500 years ago we started to develop agriculture and uh, developed extensive agricultural pursuits growing on various crops we had orchards and other uh, resources uh, readily available on the land deer and and uh, fish and it was just a fairly rich environment for resources to live off of. We uh, believed in uh, a creator known as Kishela Mokwang, and that this creator was a kind and charitable uh, creator who provided everything on the earth for the people and that uh, everyone was entitled to their share of what was provided. Uh, and people were expected to give thanks to the creator, Kishela Mokwang, for everything that was provided to us, and also to live in a similar kind and charitable way as the creator themselves were. And there were certain principles that were 
taught to young people from an early age, courage and respect, truth, uh, wisdom, all these things similar to what's called the seven grandfather teachings of the Anishinaabek. We uh, went by these same principles and people learned them from a very early age. You know, there is no hitting or threats of children back in those days. Simple words were enough to instruct children on how to behave and, and none of this violence occurred as far as I know. And a lot of this information that I'm talking about isn't stuff I'm just making up. These are observations mainly from a guy named John Heckwelder. He was a Moravian missionary who lived among the Delawares for about 60 years, almost his whole life, really. And he observed these things over this amount of time and saw that these, this is the way our societies operated. And that's where this information comes from, a lot of it. You know, we uh, lived in what were basically peaceful societies. Uh, our villages, there were no uh, fortifications around them. There was no threats from anywhere. We were a very large group of people, so we didn't have these threats from anywhere else. There was extensive trade that occurred between our nation and all up and down the Mississippi River and up in northern into Canada and, and even into the uh, Caribbean. There's uh, evidence of things that were collected from these distant places in archeological sites. <coughs> so things actually weren't too bad, I don't think, for a long time. And, our original homelands of Lenape Hoking. And you can see this in the report of a, a guy named Giovanni de Verrazzano to the King of France in 1524, when he sailed along the Northeast coast of North America and stopped at a number of Indian villages along the way. And he, uh, he was, a, he was an Italian guy sailing for the King of France. And it looked like his mission was really just to get to know the people in North America more than anything else. And in his own words, he describes them as a beautiful people and a beautiful land. It was a friendly, peaceful encounter. The food was, in his own words, delectable. Uh, the people were healthy. And the end was of old age. People died of old age. That there was no other problems that people seemed to have had. And he stayed at one village for 15 days and other villages for different periods of time. And his last comment before he left was, we made very good friends. You know, uh, a very incredible encounter really in 1524. And that's what's known as the first contact uh, with European explorers in the New York area. Uh, 85 years later, Henry Hudson sailed into the uh, New York area and he was uh, had a little different attitude than Verrazano, I can tell you. Hudson was employed by the English at first to find a way to China. He went went north into the Arctic but couldn't find a way. And then he got a job working for the Dutch West India Company to find another way to China. And he came over to New York and began sailing up the Hudson River, thinking he would get to China that way. However, they didn't have much luck finding China. And I think they were quite frustrated in their efforts actually to, and disappointed. And they, seemed to have done a lot of drinking on this voyage. And even when they came into New York, there was some sort of little fight with the local Muncie people. One of their uh, sailors was shot in the neck with an arrow and killed actually. Uh, and then they went up the river and, and didn't find a way to China. So they came back and I think they were rather disappointed. Uh, and they started kind of shooting their way back down the river. And when they got to the New York area, there was all kinds of conflict and 
and, and these guys probably all half smashed and, and drunk went out in their boats with all these these uh the weapon was actually called a murderer, believe it or not, and these other uh guns that they had back in those days and they went hunting for people to just pick on and beat up, I guess, because they couldn't find their way to China. So anyway, uh he uh he left the area and then sailed up to uh, Hudson Street and Hudson Bay. And the re the way we know all this stuff is that his his first mate, a guy named Robert Jewett, kept a journal of this trip. And just like Verrazano made a report to the King of France, uh, Robert Jewett kept a journal of Hudson's voyage as well. And a lot of it has to do with sailing information that gets quite monotonous, but every once in a while you'll see contact with uh, First Nations people. And uh, Robert Jewett wrote extensively about the contact with the people on the Hudson River in New York. But as Hudson went up into the Hudson Strait area to find his way to China, something happened on the boat and Robert Jewett actually caused a mutiny and kicked Hudson out of the boat into a little little uh, skiff. He put his son in there and, and a couple other guys from the ship and they cast them off into the Hudson Strait in the Arctic Ocean, never to be seen again. So this was quite an interesting crew, actually. It seems like there was problems right from the start with this crew, even in England, before they got here, there was differences uh, in eagles, I guess. I don't know what it was, but it was a bad second contact with the Muncies, at least. And I think we were somewhat introduced to a different attitude, a different way of doing things with uh, Hudson that didn't occur with Verrazano. But Hudson came in to that area and founded New York for the Dutch. West India Company. And I'd like to get that a little bit clear because the Dutch West India Company was a business really, and they did all this exploring uh, with the permission of the Dutch government, but it really wasn't the Dutch government that was doing the exploring. It was the Dutch West India Company, and they decided to establish a outpost on Manhattan Island and Manhattan is a Muncie word, meaning supposedly Rocky Island. But there's a story that the Muncies sold Manhattan Island for $24 worth of beads and trinkets. The fact is, there is no deed for the sale of Manhattan Island. There never was and there never will be uh, one produced because it doesn't exist. It's a myth, really. There is a Muncie version of this history of the sale of Manhattan Island, and it comes from an oral statement made in a letter to the President of the United States in 1849, actually, President Zachary Taylor. There was a number of Muncies in White River, Indiana, who made an incredibly long letter to the President explaining our dilemma about having lost all of our lands. And in that they talk about providing the Dutch West India Company with enough land uh, the size of a, they call it a bullock robe, but the size of a deer hide, say, to plant themselves on overnight. And overnight was a metaphor for a period of one year, but they, Dutch West India Company people took this, this deer hide and they cut it into a long strip so that instead of being this big, it was that big and took the whole island rather than this little area that we were gonna give them to farm on for a year. So that's really the only evidence regarding any land transaction regarding the entirety of Manhattan Island. There are other transactions and deeds that occurred in the 1630s for parts of Manhattan, but you know, when I went down there a few years ago to say I was there to collect the rent, they were, they were quite shocked that uh, 
uh, that somebody might still have a claim there, but the fact is we do. And we're not through with that yet. But this beginning of land transactions in uh, Manhattan Island resulted in some 600 land transactions between the Munsees and the Dutch and the English over a hundred year period before we lost all of our land. That's a lot of land transactions. The first uh, director of the Dutch West India Company, a guy named William Keith, kind of set a policy, a, a statement of how things were gonna be done when he was involved in two serious massacres of the Muncie people, actually. There was a report that some Raritan Indians had stolen a pig from a, a Dutch person. This report was wrong. Actually, the Dutch person's servant stole the pig, but the Indians were blamed for it. And Keith sent in an army who killed them all and tortured them and some other things just over this false allegation of stealing a pig. And he then had another massacre occur to the white Keesqueaks on Manhattan Island when they were seeking refuge from being attacked by somebody else and massacred quite a few people, like 80 people, and, and did some horrible things to them after death that I not can try and describe. They're all written down by a somebody who was there, a guy named William DeVries, uh, who saw all of these things happen. And it's a pretty horrible, horrible, horrible stuff that occurred. But like I say, this was the Dutch West India Company, and these were soldiers who did this work. They weren't settlers, and I like to distinguish that. He uh, was involved in another massacre of 500 Muncie's and 120 soldiers when they were surprised at a gathering in the woods and were all shot and burnt to death. You know, these are pretty serious events. And when Keith left and Stoy Vessant came in to be the new director, things didn't change that much. So right from the time of settlement with the Dutch West India Company until about 1664, relations were described as what he called tolerable. It was called working disagreements based on a creative misunderstanding. It was a rather strange world to live in, I suppose. All these massacres, different wars going on. There's a case where a thousand warriors came down the Hudson River in 70 canoes and destroyed settlements on Staten Island. I mean, we could have technically wiped everybody out in the area if we'd wanted to, but we didn't do that. We caused more property damage than death, actually, throughout our history, whereas we suffered a lot of death at the same time. Disease was a serious issue during the 1660s, and our population went from a good probably 20,000 to about 5,000 in that 40 years in addition to the impacts of war and murders and other other things like that. It seems like a bad period of time, but I'm not sure it was all that bad. There, in between these wars and diseases, people had to find a way to get along with each other, almost like it is today. We live on a reserve, three reserves west of London here. But we have relationships here in London. We have relationships in small towns with farmers. You know, 30 years ago, there was a killing in uh, Strathroy, a manslaughter, where a townsperson was killed by a native person from the Raz. And that caused bad relations between all of us for a number of years, actually. It's not bad now, but, you know, these things still happen. You know, when you see uh, train train railings being blocked and such, people all over get kind of upset about it. I don't know if things are actually that much different now than they really were a long time ago. You don't see massacres and such anymore, or wars. We're trying to get along a little better, but there are still issues. 
So, like I say, we uh, had a tumultuous 40-year relationship with the Dutch West India Company, at least. And the settlers that came into the area were from a number of different nations in Europe. So it was quite a variety. As I said, we were involved in some 600 land transactions over a 100-year period. That's a lot of land deals. And by the 1664, we'd lost about 10% of our lands in these lands transactions, which we really didn't have much choice because of our continuing depopulation through war and disease and the increasing population of settlers, which there was no end to really. Uh, in 1664, the English sailed into New Amsterdam, that was as it was called back then, and took over and renamed it New York. And for about 10 years, things were actually pretty good. No wars, no diseases, and relations with settlers seem to have been all right now as well, which makes me think it really wasn't bad, bad before then either. We had kind of not the best relationships with the English after that and ended up losing all of our lands, the remaining 90% of it under English control. And what when, when the French Indian War came around in the 1750s, the Seven Years War, it's also called, we actually sided with the French for uh, the first part of that war because of our anger over the way the English treated us with our lands. And we caused a lot of damage in our own old homelands to settlers' property and such uh, because of that. However, we uh, had a leader named, as, named Tidi Uskong who came into the picture around that time. And he got all the Muncies and other local nations together and made peace with the English. And so we became part of what's known as the covenant chain of peace and friendship with the English in about 1758. And uh, have continued that covenant chain of peace and friendship till this day, although the chain has gotten a little rusty and maybe it's broken in a couple of places and needs to be renewed and polished as they said back then that it would need to be. So we sided with the English during the last part of the French Indian War. And then when the English failed to live up to their promises to our alliance during that war, that's when Pontiac's War came into place in around 1763, when all the First Nations in the Great Lakes uh, started attacking and taking over British forts and getting them kicked out of here like they said they would do uh, before the war was over. So that resulted in what's called the Royal Proclamation, basically, which protected Indian lands west of the Ohio River and called them Indian lands, and only the crown could buy those lands uh, and sell them to settlers. Individuals were not allowed to, to buy any of these lands. However, and it's my belief that the Americans, the soon to become Americans, did not like this proclamation because it prevented them from getting access to the lands. And that's the real reason for the American Revolution, as far as I'm concerned, was to get access to these lands west of the Ohio River, rather than anything to do with paying taxes. Because that's what occurred from the revolution, is the proclamation became null and void, except here in Canada, and the Americans gained access to all of the lands west of the Ohio River. We uh, sided with the English during the American Revolution and fought with a corps known as Butler's Rangers, which also included Joseph Brandt and his Mohawks 
And again, we did a lot of damage to the, our old, in our old homelands that we'd been kicked out of. Such damage that the army of the United States decided to punish the Muncies and burned and destroyed all of our villages in the Susquehanna Valley and and made us move from there up to Cataraugus, New York. And during this burning and destroying of our villages and crops, this army walked away with $30,000 worth of loot from our villages, stuff they stole after we were gone which shows that we actually were doing quite well, I think, financially at least. If we could leave that much behind as we tried to get ahead of this advancing army, we must have taken a fair amount with us. And it confirms this observation from Heckwalder that the Muncie's always had a good treasury of wampum and other valuable things. Nobody, no one person had uh, had stuff like you know, had everything. It was a community chest in a sense. So we ended up uh, moving from the Susca from New New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, across the Alleghenies to the Susquehanna Valley, over up into Cataraugus, New York, over into Sandusky, Ohio, as well as the Miami River in Ohio, and. Uh, after the American Revolution, we were involved in what was known as the Indian Wars from 1783 to 1795, where all of the First Nations, the Western Confederacy that I talked about, uh, fought against the Americans to keep them on the eastern side of the Ohio River. And this was with the, the verbal backing of the British, although they never gave us any military backing in any way. Uh, during this time in 1793, Governor, Lieutenant Governor Simcoe came through down the Thames and stopped at the Delaware Castle, as he called it back then, with Joseph Brandt, seven Mohawk warriors and seven officers, and they stayed overnight. And at that time, Simcoe gave us a deed for 12 by 6 miles of land on the Thames River, according to uh, our own people who were there at the time in things they later wrote. So we continued to stay on the Thames and the Indian Wars were over in 1795 at a place called the Battle of Fallen Timbers in Michigan. And things became somewhat peaceful for a while after that until the War of 1812 when the Muncies were again significantly involved in another war. Uh, we fought under a guy named Colonel John Norton during this war of 1812, and there's a couple of books on him, if anybody. He was quite a character. He was Joseph Brandt's right-hand man, actually. And he was the last person to ever fight a duel in Canada in 1814 or something like that. He was in a duel with another guy in Bradford and they shot him and killed him. And it was a fair fight, I guess. So, so this is the type of characters we're talking about some of these guys. So we continued to reside on the Thames. And then in 1820, there was a surrender made of this area and we weren't included in it. And we were kind of upset because we made some treaty for 12 by 6 miles of land and all of a sudden it was being taken away. So this temporary agreement was made on May 9th, 1820. And on May 10th, 1820, we went, five of our men went to the local Indian agent and you know, asked them what the heck's going on here. And from that date until 1909, we sent 23 petitions to the federal government complaining about our land not being given to us the way it was promised because of our alliance with the British during the American Revolution. So this year, 2020, is 200 year anniversary since our first complaint about not having our lands protected 
the way they were supposed to be. And like I say, we'd already been dealing with land issues some couple hundred years before that, you know, over six, we know how to deal with land anyway, make sure it was secured to us. And that's why we sent 23 petitions handwritten by our members to the government outlining our history. And a lot of the history I've talked about comes from what these guys said. I really couldn't believe it at first when I read what they said in the 1800s. But after research, it turns out everything they said true. So it's pretty neat. Uh, our people through the 1800s, even though we didn't have a treaty, continued to work the land, to farm. We were uh, participants in, in various fairs of the area and won prizes on a regular basis. We won such on a regular basis that they actually stopped us from competing by making an Indian category in the local fairs. So we couldn't compete against people who weren't Indians. Only Indians compete against Indians, but that's the type of prejudice that we experienced during those times. And, you know, after all we'd been through and our alliance with the British, when we came to Canada, you know, we thought we were safe and secure, but unfortunately the colonial government did not respect these relationships that we had before through alliances and such and all the, people that we did have these relationships with were now passing away and they were old and they weren't in power anymore. And these new colonial governments came in who had no understanding of this and basically decided to start telling us how things were going to be. And they created laws and policies to take uh, our children and put them into residential schools to prevent us from speaking our languages and, and knowing our culture and histories. And, you know, after we all we've been through, as if that wasn't enough, we come here hoping to get, like I say, some sense of security and, and prosper like anyone else. And yet the government decides to, to keep us down and to assimilate us and to have no respect for who we are and who we were. And so the result is a lot of our communities today are living with the impacts of these laws and policies that have destroyed families, destroyed communities, left uh, people with a lot of issues that we have to pick up the pieces and put back together. You know, it's a long, Hi, we seem to have an interruption. Um, I'm going to make uh, non-video participants visible here. This is uh, David at the Kensington Village Association. I think this is a good time to go to some uh, music. What do we have here? Oh, I think they're setting up another another stage. We'll just um, go to something else for a few minutes.